Famous last words. You ever heard the expression? There's a whole list of famous last words. You can Google it and see, and uh, time won't allow me to get into it, but things people said at the very end of their lives have been documented. Famous people, people that you would know. Um, I, I, David here, King David, there's several different passages of things he said as he knew he was dying. One of the things he did was I think it was cool. He called his son to him, and he says, I want to talk to you. And, uh, and Solomon knew that he was, dad was getting to, you know, there was a, at any moment he could go. And here's what he said, uh, and we're going to unpack it today. Now, the days of David drew near that he should die, and he charged Solomon, his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man. Everybody say, prove yourself. Prove yourself. Prove yourself a man. And keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, keep his commandments, his judgments, his testimonies. Notice how as David's leaving, he's saying, Solomon, I want you to focus on God. Focus on God. Learn from, you know, you can't keep a statute or a requirement or a way if you don't know it. How can you keep it? You may stumble on it accidentally, but for the, for the most part, if to, so he's saying, get to know what he wants, get to know who God is, and then obey him. His judgments and his testimonies, as, and that's what the Old Testament, the Old Testament does a tremendous job of giving us the history of how God saw Israel through a lot of, and forgave them, and protected them, and forgave them, and freed them, and forgave them. I mean, it's just all through there. So get to know his judgments, his testimonies, as is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. So everybody doesn't get to prosper in all they do and wherever they turn. Not everybody. No, David said, if you'll do these things, then you can do these things. So the idea that, you know, some people think that uh, everybody's called universalism, that everybody goes to heaven. That's not true. Everybody does not go to heaven. People say, this is a real pet peeve of mine, because some of them are my colleagues. They'll say, well, we're all God's children. That's not true. We're all created in God's image. And you've heard me teach on this. We become God's children. As many as received Jesus, he gave them the power to become sons of God, John says. Not everybody's a son of God. And because not everybody's a son of God, not everybody gets to go to heaven. So heaven's a wonderful place, but the door to heaven is Jesus. Amen. And so he's saying, if you want to prosper in all you do and wherever you turn, then you work backwards in these three verses. Keep his ways, keep his statutes, keep his commandments, keep his judgments, keep his testimonies, and you'll be strong. But I like the part where he says, prove yourself a man. Be courageous is what he's saying in the NLT. Prove yourself, in other words. There's going to be some bumps in the road. There's going to be some potholes. You're going to have to make some decisions. You're going to have to tell some people no. You're going to have to tell yourself no. You're going to have to tell your kids no. It's not in there, but I'll just tell you. So he charges him. He says, Solomon, I love you so much. And many people, we know he was the richest man that ever lived, and many people say he was the smartest man he ever lived, but I will just tell you, and I don't mean to preach to the end and backwards, but I'll just tell you, Solomon didn't do this. If you know his life. He was good for a while, but he made a lot of mistakes. How many of you know that's true? He was good for a while. He loved God and made a lot of mistakes. Does that sound like you or me? A little bit. You know, I mean, I, we don't have multiple wives, you know, but he made a lot of mistakes. But this is a framework that we could pass on from generation to generation for any, to any kid, this charge. What she's saying is, A, observe, put it up there, observe the requirements of the Lord. To observe something, I must read it, I must see it, I must know it. Some of you, my heart goes out to you because you may make some mistakes because you don't even know what a mistake is. Now, inside each of us, the Bible says, is a conscience or a spirit that we can kind of know we're doing wrong, even though we don't know what it is we're doing wrong. How I many know what I'm talking about? It's in there. They find out when they've gone to uh, unreached tribes that they have, within those unreached tribes, that they have a sense of who God is and has a conscience, and they never even had a missionary. God places that in us. And, and, and so, what, what, what Father David is doing to son Solomon is he's refining that and saying, no, no, it's not just, I want you to know. I want you to go to Sunday school. I want you to go to Wednesday night service. I want you to go to youth group. I want you to be a ranger, a missionette if they have that. That's what he's saying. 
Then he says, once you know, walk in or follow God's ways. Learn them and then follow them. How many of you know there's a big gap between learning something and following it? There's a big gap from here, the brain, to the 18 inches to my heart. And along that 18 inches sometimes, because of flesh and selfishness, things fall away. Because I'll just testify real quick. And I, I won't, I've known to do right or wrong and have chosen wrong. And I'm the only one who's ever done that, apparently. Some, oh, you're agreeing, you're agree, yeah. Well, you know, but yet, Steve, it's confusing. You know, Steve, focus on keeping the beat. That's your job today. Fo no, I know what he's saying. Yeah, I mean, thankfully, as we go through life and we get, as we get a little older in life, Mike, not as old as Bill, but as we get a little older in life, we learn the consequences of missing out from what we know is right to the heart of what's doing right, don't we? And, and to be quite honest with this, the best way is because we love the Lord so much we wouldn't do it. But if you're going to let someone says, well, they just didn't want to get in trouble, I say, great. I'm glad they didn't want to get in trouble if it kept them from doing it. The best thing would be not to want to do it, and that comes later. But the fact that they say, I know if I do that, that this is going to happen, that's called wisdom. That's called learning and saying, we're not, I'm not doing that again. I've done that, and I don't like it. So I'm going to not just observe or learn. I'm going to walk in his ways. I'm going to walk him out. I'm going to make good choices. That's what's, David's dying. He's saying, son, I want you to get this. And then he's saying, keep, once you get it, and this is where, as you know, my testimony from about 19, 18 to 20 right in there, keep the commandments. It's not enough to have them and lose them. Keep them. Keep the commandments. Once we get, let's not, uh, it's described in scripture, and we won't turn to it, but because it's crude, but he says that if you don't have it in your heart, you won't keep it. And they use this example, which is gross, but I'll use it because a dog returns to its vomit. Once he gets rid of it, he goes back to it. That's, that's, how, that's how God sees it when we go back and do a sin that, we, that we, we've already repented for, and we said, Lord, I'm sorry, and then we go back to it. It's disgusting, I know. But it's disgusting to God and disgusting to us when we go back and do something. Isn't that gross? Terribly gross. It's enough to make you not want pets. And then basically he gets into the character, and he says, Mitch, he says, show yourself a man. Show yourself a man that you can reach a place where you are modeling, it's not Christianity yet, but godliness to the next generation. He's worried about his grandkids and his great-grandkids. What David's doing is he's planting a legacy into the family. And David wasn't perfect, but he was a man after God's heart. He didn't have perfection, but he had direction, the Bible says. And he messed up greatly. And you know, we've preached on David so much, you know, and maybe we can identify and, and be careful when you say, well, I, I never murdered anybody. Well, Jesus said if you hate somebody and don't stop, it's like murder. So, you know, we, we, we all have that same spirit to contend with. Secondly, I want to thank God. I just want to take a moment, and I do this on Father's Day, to thank God for a mentor that came to my life. You know, I my, my, led my dad to the Lord right before he passed away. I didn't know he was going to pass away. But he called me and asked me to, to do that, to come down to uh, Arizona and pray with him. It's a wonderful story, and I'm so grateful for it. It, it softens all my memories of, of the way he was. And, and my wife says that once my dad accepted Jesus, God, it was like a, getting a, a fish in a boat. He said, okay, come on home. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but that's what my mom, my mom, my wife thinks. Um, but uh, so there wasn't a great relationship there with my dad because of his, you know, uh, uh, sinner sin church, you know, ungodly people. You know, we need to be, I think we need to be, tougher on ourselves and, and a little bit more merciful to people who aren't Christians. I really do. But it was, it, growing up in the family, it was tough. But my, my uh, God, out through his love and mercy, put, sent someone into my life. His name is Walt, Walt McLaughlin, who I'm going to get to see soon. He's now in his late 80s. And uh, it was a mentor to me, by far. Just, just uh, it took me with all my flaws and all my mistakes and just loved me. And, and gave me a job and gave me, was my best man at my wedding. Um, just was our youth director, volunteer for over 20 years. And had youth groups up of over 50, 60 kids. Remember, we had a great youth group, didn't we? Because he loved kids. But, but really, uh, he, he loved a lot of the youth, but I was his favorite. Come on, though, you know it's true. And you all understand why. I'm just so lovable, you know, Mitch, come on. You get it, right, Mitch? All right, thank you. 
And so it opened up his home I, a couple of times when my relationship with my dad was, was shattered. He opened up his home, and I lived with him. I lived with their family. And uh, helped me through Bible college, uh, seminary, and everything. So, 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 w- w- what I'm asking you to do is, if you have them in your life, I want you to pay attention to godly mentors, people set into your life. I came here later on as a 36 year old, young. I was a youth pastor. In fact, for the first 10 years, I pastored this church as a youth pastor. I'm surprised any of you stayed. But there was people who helped me get through it. Bill Houseman, Bill's dad was a mentor in my life. And, and, you know, he never disrespected me. Even when he corrected me, he did it in a way where it wasn't disrespectful. It was out of love. And, and so, so I'm here to tell you that God has placed mentors in my This is what it means. Are you ready? Now, it, when it says, this is the spiritual side, pay attention to this. I will be a father to the fatherless. God doesn't come down and sit in your living room and help you. God sends godly people in your life. And through those people, God fathers you. How many of you today would say, whether it's your actual father, which, which a blood father is also sent to you by God to father you, but who would say to you that you have a mentor in your life that acknowledges that or, or represents that in your life, that you had one or you grew up alone? Hold your hand up. Hold it up. Look at that. Look at that. God is a father to the father. No, he will send people, and, and no father encompasses all that area, but maybe there's an area where it's not there, and here comes a youth director or a coach or just a godly coach or just a godly person in the church who takes interest in you and will bless you and will, will have influence on in your life, a mentor in your life. Pay attention. Pay attention to them. Get yourself one if you don't have one, by the way. Get yourself one. If you're, if you're under 30, you should have one. And really, it, uh, I wish, I, I wish uh, that I was around Walt. And I wish Brother, Brother Bill was still with us. I'd still let him mentor me. At my, I mean, you know, I'm not as old as Bill Houseman, but I could still use a mentor, you know. Boy, we're going to milk that cow for a while, I got to tell you. Oh, yeah. Internationally, worldwide, Bill Houseman is the oldest. So when you pay attention to me- when you value a mentor, you, you change. I'm ch- everything in my life that I've ever changed, and I've told you this before, is because I changed my value. And you all, we all have values. You don't. You might not say it's a value, but you have them. They're, that's who you're hanging out, what you're doing, where, where you where you invest your time. That's where you're spending your values. And so, what we want to do is we want to. F- what he's saying is, uh, the father here is saying to his son, "Fear God, respect and reverence God." Now I know when some people say fear God, they think to be afraid of God. If, if you want to mix in a little bit of that, like a f- fudge ripple ice cream of fearing missing heaven or fearing judgment and, and a life in, in, of, of damnation, I can live with that. But my fear of God is not one where I'm like, oh, God, no, I have a relationship with him. My fear is an awe and a respect for him and a reverence and that I don't want to disrespect him. You see what I'm saying? So that's a healthy fear. But, but if a fear, a fear of, of, uh, of smelling the smoke... If that helps you, if you're young, that young in your walk, I-, I can live with that at the beginning. It's like when people say, oh, they're just sorry because they got caught. As if that's a, I'm glad they're sorry anyway. I'll take sorrow as a pastor sometimes anywhere I can get it. Now, I prefer they're sorry because they broke the heart of God. But if you're sorry because you got caught, okay, we'll start there. Because I've been with people who got caught that aren't sorry. That's, those are some tough birds. They're caught, they did it, and they don't care. Their disrespect and irreverence to God is out there. And then you'll see this month T-shirts with Satan and rainbows and I don't even like to call I'd say multicolored. I don't even like to call them rainbow, but uh, just, a, just a blasphemous disrespect of all accounts. And so, you know, so not everybody agrees with me, but I decided I'm not, I'm not protest, picketing and challenging people who are lost away from God. I'm challenging believers to pray and believe God and celebrate the things of God. I don't expect people that aren't Christians to listen to what the Bible says and have a reverence for God. They're not believers. Their heart, the Bible makes it clear their heart, they haven't had a changed heart. But once we have a changed heart, we ought to be able to seek God and pray and love God and make good choices. Amen? Paul says their eyes are blinded even. They can't even see it sometimes. We know that the fear of the Lord in Proverbs 1 is the beginning of wisdom. We know that the fear of the Lord prolongs our days. 
The, the Ecclesiastes says the end of the matter and all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. Fearing God, having awe and respect for God is so important. And then, and then once, you, once you get a mentor or a parent, and you, by the way, I said, I said you're, you're certainly, thank God. Oh, I just want to stop and just insert this in. If you have, because I didn't have it, I, I, a lot of times it's my point of reference, but, and I'm not, I have a holy jealousy, I believe it is, because I love to see it. If you've got a godly mom and you've got a godly dad, God bless, has already blessed you. If you have that, if that's your memories, not perfect, but you knew they loved God, you knew they... You know, and they, and they had an example in your life. They prayed for you, your family. There was a spirit in your home of godliness. You know, uh, 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 that when you come in, ever come into a home and you just sense God's presence? You know, my, our home growing up was a spirit of police. No, we had the police there all the time. I mean, the police were there a lot. So, I mean, I remember as a little boy walking at a ball game about seventh grade, and the cops came up to me in front of my friends and said, Stevie Miller, how you doing? Your parents still together? <laughs> the cops are asking me. You know, that's awkward. Because they were there so much. In other words, a house can have a spirit, see? And the neighbors would hear all the fighting and yelling, and, her, and they'd call. I think they call them well checks now. But so, you know, so, so if you have a different house, I got a holy jealousy sort of, you know. I mean, wow, what it must be nice to go. Not, not perfect. There's a little fuss. But, you know, there's little fusses and things. I get it. I, 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 but overall, the Lord is comfortable there. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Did you, how many people had a house like that? Let's testify. Grew up in a house like that. Oh, man, I'm so jealous of you. Oh, man. In a good way, you know. Yeah. Are you grateful? Be grateful for that, that you had a house where you could express, where you didn't come in and wonder, you know, was, was, was mom leaving or was, you know, or the police coming or was mom going to be gone? I mean, I mean, it was, what a, wow. Be grateful. And if you have godly parents, listen to them. Listen to your parents. What happened over there? You threw me an amen? You're sitting next to your daughter, so it's, yeah. Elbowing the daughter literally during the service, that's funny. The Bible says in Proverbs 1, my son, hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother. The, the Proverbs is just wisdom. It, 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 it's time. And, and I would say to you, maybe you're a little further down the tracks and your parents are still alive and you haven't done it yet. Let's start today. Find something that, that you can do to communicate to your parents that you love them and you appreciate them. If my dad was alive today, I would tell him, thanks, Dad. You always kept food on the table and we always had heat. You can find something. Amen? And, and you say, well, that's no big deal. Well, find somebody who didn't have heat and went to bed hungry. Yeah. Yep. Proverbs 6 says, my son, keep your father's commandments and forsake. And isn't it interesting, by the way, and don't, I don't want you to miss this, Mike, Phil, and all. This, he's teaching now. Solomon is teaching. These are Proverbs. Many of them are his. He's teaching after what he heard from his father. So we know that he caught it. Because a lot of what he writes is about obeying your parents and the very things that in the original text that I read to you that he said to do. It's nice. It, hey, guys, isn't it nice to know when our sons catch it? <laughs> it's rare. <laughs> right, the times when they're in junior high, we're like, oh, man, this is not going to go well. But then once in a while, they catch it. I remember when I found my kids changing the channel. I had left a room. Something was on. Not, not, it was regular TV, but it just, it just was making fun of sin, and it was funny. That's the problem. You know, they're good. And so I said, you know, I can't watch this, and I got up, and I started to go upstairs, or around the bed, I should say, and I heard one of my children, I won't give which one, say which one. I don't want to get the big head, but uh, they said, we ought to change this. That was so good. That I didn't have to, you're going to change it, bless God. We're no, nope. I just said, uh, this isn't set with me. Isn't it nice when they catch one and when they catch it, when they make a good decision and you get to see it? Wow. Well, that's what Solomon's doing. A lot of his teaching is just, he just plagiarizes from David, which is fine. That's what we want. We want our kids, we, when we teach godliness, we want them to teach their kids godliness. I tell, I, I, I expect my children to be better parents than I was. I didn't have me as a dad, and I certainly didn't have Lil as a mom, which which majority of the credit could go to. I tell my son-in-law when he had father-son talk, I said, son, you, you're a much better dad than me, and you ought to be. 
And if the Lord tarries, Trip should be a better dad than you. You, you, you get what's happening here? Of course. But the teachings of Solomon that I'm reading are actually what David taught him. That's so cool to see it in the Bible. Be very selective. I have to move on. Be very selective in who you allow to influence you. Be very selective. If, if we're influencing others, we better be careful and make sure what we're getting is the right stuff. Because you're responsible. Once you become a parent, Richard, and some of your younger parents, says, your response, what you teach your children and what they grab a hold of, you will be. That's, I just became Alabamian. Holt. A hold of. <laughs> what you became a hold of, you're responsible. Paul says as a teacher, and all parents are teachers to some degree, don't want to be one unless you're going to be a godly one. Because how I influence you, and it goes for son-in-laws too, by the way. I'll just tell you there, young man, since you're sitting there so smiling, taking mental notes of everything I say. If I influence him poorly, I, I will answer to God for that. If, I don't know what level of influence I have with him, but whatever it is, if I influence him incorrectly because I am, I'm a mentor. He didn't pick me. He picked my daughter. And, oh, well, I'm just a gravy on the potato, you know. I was like a two-for-one there, huh? Yeah, we think, yeah. So, you know, but you, whoever you have that you're influencing or people are being influenced by you, if you're a Christian, you better do it right because God's watching. You better not take shortcuts in front of them. You better not compromise in front of them once you're influencing them. But on the other side of the coin, you better, when you start picking people to be your mentors that you're going to sit under and listen to, you better make sure you pick well. Because there is stuff that rubs off. There is influence that rubs off. So be very selective. And not just older people, even people within your peer group that we allow to influence us. Listen to what it says again. Here's, here's the, the, the child of David. My child, if sinners entice you, turn your back on them. They may say, come and join us. Let's hide and kill someone. Just for fun, <laughs> let's ambush the innocent. I don't know what you did when you were a teenager, but this is some pretty serious stuff right here. Hey, you want to go to the mall? No, let's go kill someone. Wow, I got to tell you, you got to pick better friends. Let's swallow them alive like the grave. Let's swallow them whole like those who go down the pit of the earth. Think of the great things we'll get. We'll fill our houses with all the stuff we take. What a bunch of schemers. Do you ever have anybody influence you to do something that you wouldn't have done if you were by yourself? Not that we can blame. You made the choice. Have anybody? I'm, I've, had, I've had people influence me poorly. Yeah. Yeah, but it was my fault for picking the wrong, the wrong influencers. And then Paul writes to Church of Corinthians. He says, some of you parents, you're missing it. You're just letting your kids go out. You don't know who they're with. You don't know where they're, when they're staying over. You don't know what movies they're watching or, or, or what other kids are joining them. Here's what he says. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good morals and good habits. Don't be deceived. See, when, when Paul writes, don't be deceived, it means some people are being deceived that it doesn't matter. They're at their house. It doesn't matter. It matters. It matters who you let the people that are under your influence hang out with. It matters. If I was on my deathbed and I could talk to my children, I would pull them close and I would say, it matters who you let my grandkids hang out with. Be careful. Be careful. I'd pull Jake close. I'd say, Jake, until Jaden's 30, I do not want her to leave the basement. Keep her in the basement behind locked doors. Goodbye, Jake. <laughs> I was speaking earlier of the, of the incubator we call home. There's supposed to be a places, and I know it's not the case everywhere, and again, I'm not trying to bring back bad memories, but a home, a, a godly home in particular is supposed to be an incubation from the pain, hurt, and the nastiness of the world. Again, there's no perfect home until we get to heaven. That's why I want to go to heaven. How about you? But there should be some sense of safety and acceptance and comfort and love. Can we all agree on that? I don't want to get too deep into this cycle babble, but, you know, it should be a sense there, you know. So, so in that, what makes it right is not that there's perfection, but that there's a a love within the family that's evident, evident love. Put that up there, will you? That's uh, number three. Are you, you in double duty? 
Oh, it's not working. All right, well, you're going to have to just pay attention like the olden days, back in the olden days. Let your love, your wife, your kids, and your grandkids, this is my prayer for you as a family. And I know this from the hurt side of the other side, so I can pray it with a passion. Lord, I don't want anybody to go to sleep anytime in your home with questions about whether or not they're loved. That would be my goal. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Doesn't mean that we're not going to get get grounded or get in trouble or get spankings, but, but by the time they get in bed and close their eyes, they don't go to sleep wondering whether or not they're loved or whether mom and dad are going to be there when they wake up. An incubation of, of love in, you know, in a godly home. I don't think that's too much to ask. I was so wrecked as a kid growing up because of inconsistencies in my family, and I've really guarded. My, my mom, except the Lord, was in our church eight years almost, honey, right? And you saw her, but there, before that, she was just without, just God, godless. She grew up, and so made a lot of, a lot of uh, poor choices and all, and God forgave her, and you guys loved her, and I'm so grateful for that forever. I don't know what the world future holds, but I'll never forget the love and acceptance that my mom received. But, but, but going to bed with the security, I did not know that security. And, and, it, and it affected me later as a parent because when we would have fusses in our home, and my, uh, is Tiffany here? Yeah, I wish my son was here too. Did you? But I, I was not very good at letting things go to the next day. <laughs> in other words, we were going to stay up and get this thing straightened out. And we were going to have, we were going to have meeting, family meeting, testimony, Question and answer time, because I was re I, it was sub it was subliminal, it was subconscious. I didn't want to end it and try to go to bed, because I in my mind I wanted things to be settled before we went to bed. How many know what I'm talking about? Probably to an extreme, where there were times when we probably should have. I think when I had the kids standing at attention, you know, at at seven, nine, and eleven or whatever it was, and and each person having to write out a a testimony of what we saw and, had and who was. It, because, I, because it was so important to me to have the matter under the, and forgiven. Now, now, I didn't handle it nobly all the time because I was adamant that I was right, and we're going to get this right before we go to bed. How, you remember, Tiffany? Do you? <laughs> but that was because I grew up in a home where oftentimes through the night the fights would rage and there was a lot of insecurity. But in a godly home, I think we ought to be secure that even in our failures that we're going to be loved by morning. Isn't that, don't you think so? It ought to be that. It ought to be there. So let's agree that we can let love be evident to people in our family. Keep the passion fires burning when it comes to the marriage. Now, now this is my gift to you fathers. I'm saying keep the passion fires burning. I think you know what I'm talking about. And in case you don't know, here's what Solomon said about that. Let your fountains be blessed and, and rejoice in your wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. doe. Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Wow, that's in the Bible. That's in the Bible. Who says the Bible's boring? Be intoxicated always in her love. And by the way, I had to look at several translations to find stuff that I could read. <laughs> Just so you know. If you start wallowing around Proverbs and Songs of Solomon, <laughs> I'll tell you what. Right, get done. The old teenage boys have to read that book and go right, take a cold shower. We, that's not what we're trying to do here. This is where they're for marriages. The Bible's not boring. The Bible's the greatest marriage manual that was ever written. Ecclesiastes 9 says, Let live happily with the woman you love through all the mean, meaningless days of your life that's given you under the sun. The wife God gives you is a reward for all your earthly toil. Thank you, honey. I appreciate my reward. That's what the Bible says. That's our attitude. So what am I saying? I'm saying let's raise our children in a house of love. But the, the one that's not the unspoken because it's a theme of the Bible is, of course, love for God. But how about a love for our wives? You know, somebody said this, and I look for the quote. I've had it before. I've used it before. But did you know that the, one of the greatest gifts you can give your kids is to make sure they know that you love your wife? And each other, I should say. They know that mom and dad, well, they, they're not perfect, but I know one thing, they love each other. I still remember, I can't remember which one it was, it doesn't matter. 
every time you preach on Mother's or Father's Day, there's some testimony gets in, but something happened where I think I'll, I'll just make it Steve because he's not here. Um, and he, he just challenged. He was, he was trying to get me to side with him against his mother. That's, that's, not, that's, not, that's not very wise, is it, you know, because uh, he, he was like 10 or 11, and I could spank him. I, can't, I couldn't spank his mother, you know. So, and she was right, by the way. Some of you are, are not going to hear another word I said because you're thinking about me spanking my wife. Knock it off, I'll tell you right now. I saw you. Your countenance all just changed. What is wrong with you people? You're in church. So I told him, I said, son, I said, see, now, now, everybody come on back. Now, I want to tell you this. I said, son, I've covenanted it with your mother. You're my blood, and I love you, and I'd, I'll fight a tiger for you. But covenant trumps blood. This is what I taught him about covenant. I said, I've covenanted with your mother. I haven't covenanted with you. The, the, you know, many of our families are fractured because they place the relationship with the parent and the child above the husband and the wife. Hear me now. I do a lot of counseling. A lot of people don't even attend our church. That's the problem. It's not a problem. That's the wrong word. When you help one couple in Three Rivers, they tell their friends, <laughs> which is fine. I'm, I mean, I, we don't turn anybody away for counseling, marriage counseling, pre-marriage counseling, food bank, any of those things, we just embrace all this stuff. I, I will tell you that uh, in many cases, and I want to talk to you if you're watching, you do not put your children, and often too when they're, when they're blended families, this happens even worse, but uh, your children, the priority, it doesn't mean we don't love our kids with passion, it doesn't mean we won't sacrifice, it doesn't mean we don't, but we do not let that relationship with the, because the, you covenant with the wife. Here, here's how I'm going to say it. Since we've already said enough things that are a little bit, you know, different today. I become one with my wife. You become one with your husband. If you're, you don't become one with your children. Nowhere in Scripture. You see the difference now? Think about it. You become one with your spouse. Nowhere in the Bible that you become one with your child. So if I choose my child over my spouse, it separates Plus, I just, it's just, in most cases, it's just wisdom to side with your spouse. And you don't want your child to think he can manipulate you. And, and they'll do that. You know, we, we laugh about it. Hey, Dad, come, b -b -b go ask your mother. You know, and, then go ask your and then, you know, they try to they pick the softest one on the, whatever the topic is. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when they really want you to make it, which would cause, no, covenant trumps blood. If you remember one thing when you leave here, your relationship with your spouse is the, uh, relationship with your Lord is the most important, relationship with your spouse is the second, and then, of course, your family, and then the church family. So there you have it. And I want you to, as you do that, we want to model using things and loving people and not the other way around. There's a lot of, uh, in many churches, not here, there's a lot of weirdos. A lot of odd, odd people. Not here. Other churches. But if you go home after church and talk trash about the people in the church, don't be surprised as when your kids get older, they won't want to come to church. Hello? If you go home and talk trash about your pastor, don't be surprised. I'm talking about other churches who will watch this online. Don't be surprised if they won't want to come to church and won't respect the pastor if they come. We're supposed to love people and use things. And sometimes when we're not careful, man, we make the mistake of loving things or toys and using people, and that does not bear well. Are you hearing the heart of God? I hope you are. Is this making sense? And so you can't badmouth the church and then wonder why the next generation doesn't want to come. And lastly, everybody say lastly. Say it with a smile. You're going to get your dad's root beer here in a minute, so get happy. The way we model that as mentors, remember I said chase your mentor, but also the goal is to one day be a mentor. Now, we're automatically mentored to our kids, but I mean mentors to other young people where they admire your life the way I admire Walt and Bill's life that I chase them because I wanted their influence. So you want to become one of those people, and you do that by preferring others. We, we, we acknowledge generosity of time, talent, and treasure. We see it, and when we see that, we say, wow, I want to be like that person one day. 
Philippians 2 says, Let nothing be done throughout selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem each other, others better than ourselves. When I see that, when I see people doing that, I'm drawn like a moth to a light to that. When I see people preferring others in small or bigger, I'm drawn to that. How about you? I, I, I want to be around people like that. It's subliminal in some way. I just like, boy, I like to be around people who like to be around people. I like to be around people who bless people. I like to bless people who bless people. <coughs> Excuse me. Secondly, be determined to God to love what God loves and to despise what God hates. That's really the challenge. That's, that's really spiritual discipleship right there. Love what God loves, hate what God hates. When, when a nugget in Scripture or in your life comes up and you see God hates that, and there's a whole list of things, seven things, but it's, it's bigger than that. When, when you, what we say is, I'm going to love the things God loves, I'm going to live and, and despise those things. Proverbs 6, here's Solomon again, writing these things, he gives you that list. And the reason why I don't preach a lot of lists in here, people, why don't you preach? Because your thing may not be on the list. These aren't the only things he hates, but these are things he hates. Wicked plans, lying tongue, hands in hand. So we don't, we don't want, we want to, we're drawn to people who don't do those things. Hate evil, pride and arrogance. It's like a theme. What, what, what basically what Solomon gets to do is he gets to preach his dad's last words to the congregation. And, and he's doing that through the Proverbs, through the why, it's the wisdom book. Did you know that? So what are we taking with us besides our dad's root beer, our Slim Jims, and our coffee mug today? We're taking these things right here. Number one, we're saying we're going to be careful who we let influence us. We're declaring it now. We can't, we can't live backwards, so we've been influenced, but we're saying from this point on, it's a word, it's a biblical word. We don't use it much. It's called discernment. We're going to be real discerning, and that means we've got to watch what we watch, what we listen to, and who we listen to. We got to be careful. We got to be real discerning. It's, be, it's better. It, it, it's a little. Here's a little thing from Parkway. Me growing up. Ready? When in doubt, leave it out. So simple, but wow, so much wisdom. Set proper goals in our life that God will bless. What are your goals? Set proper goals, and don't make them so high they're unreachable. Your faith is not out here. It's right here. Pick something that you could do today, this week. Set proper goals. Value and honor your relationships. Value them. Value the ones that you have. If you, you, parents, siblings, spouses, value them. And then honor them. Let God's word shape your character. If, if the, when the Holy Spirit brings something up, and you, let it shape it. Uh, I am the pot, uh, he is the potter, I am the clay. That's a biblical, and let him shape it. Don't give up on giving up. In other words, if you gave up a lot, don't give up on it. Don't say, well, I gave up so much. Nope. Each day is a new opportunity. And then this last one, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed and no one looking around, I want to just challenge you because it would be a shame to be here today. I know I've shot pretty high with some of the challenges as we've unpacked this, this last words, famous last words from a dad to his son. Oh, please, son, he pulled him real close. I believe he kind of whispered these things in his ear. But I think if he could have, of course, it was before... Christ was born on the flesh, but accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and become a child of God. If you become a child of God, you'll never feel fatherless because when you become a child of God, Christ becomes your life. And it's easy to do. It's to accept him and receive him, believe that God sent him, that he lived a sinless life. You're here today and you'd say, Pastor Steve, I'm, today's the day. I'm, I'm really going to be convinced that in my whole heart, sold out, all in as we say around here. Jesus Christ is my Savior, and I want to do that now. Heads bowed and eyes closed, and no one looking around. You want, I, want, I want to embarrass you, but I will pray for you. Put your hand up right now. I want to pray for you today. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. This is the time we say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I accept you as, a, as God the Son. I believe that you went to the cross and died for me. People have raised their, rose in their hands today. I'm rejoicing in my heart even as I'm doing this, and we're going to pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we pray right now. For those who have lifted their hands, and Lord, and we know a miracle takes place when that happens because we come from, your word says, from darkness into marvelous light. And so I'm thankful for that today. Hallelujah. Thank you for salvation in the house of God today. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand to your feet with me this morning? I want all the dads, all the fathers to come on up here and just stand across the front. I'm going to pray a blessing upon you. Every dad who's here today. Whether your children are here or not, come on. Come on. Don't, this is going to be good. You're going to love it. You're going to need this. 
We, we are, we are, this is one of the toughest generations to raise kids in that there's ever been. I know the Vietnam War was tough. I know the 50s had their challenges, but you're raising kids in a, in a perverse world. And if you're going to maintain the standards and of influence, and first of all, we have to be, listen to me, we've got to be stronger as dads and grandfathers than we've ever been. We've got to be more committed than we've ever been. And we also be more connected to get the wisdom that we need to give. How many of you get a sense that we need to be more connected to God than we've ever been, more passionate about him, more grateful for his sacrifice so that, when, so, when they're, so that we can set the right example and have the wisdom and when and how to pass that on because I know it's tough in some circumstances. But I'm believing that you can do it. And I know we've got a lot of people away camping and visiting family, and that's what this group right here. Can you imagine if this group would be, would be really sold out and committed, and I believe you will be. The influence that we can have on our families and communities will be great. So bow your heart, heads and bow your hearts and close your eyes. I want to pray in Jesus' name right now. I pray a blessing on these men who stepped out and said, God, I'm going to live for you. I'm going to serve you. My heart's going to be for you all the days of my life, God. I'm going to be the mentor you've called me to be. I'm going to be the wise, the wise David in the life of my Solomons that you placed in my life. I'm going to speak life and truth and mercy and grace. I'm going to make good choices. I'm going to believe that you can guide and direct me. I'm going to be filled with your Holy Spirit, and I'm going to be that. I'm going to be a forgiver. I'm going to be a man of mercy. I'm going to be a man of grace, but I'm also going to be a man of wisdom. I'm going to be a man of holiness and godliness, and I'm going to model that not just to my blood family, but to the church family. And I'm going to become, as you call me and provide, I'm going to be the mentor that you'd want me to be. So, God, we thank you for it, God. Forgive us, Lord, of our, that when we have missed the mark, and, God, I pray in Jesus' name that we can be the dads and the godly fathers you've called us to be. And all God's people say it. Amen. Now, I want you men to stay right here. If your dad is up here, I want you to come up here right now. Come on, get up here and give him some. Come on, come up here and give him some love. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, come on, come on. Praise the Lord. Look at that. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now some of you wish your kids were here now, don't you? But anyway, if you, if you accepted the Lord today, and I know some of you did, you raised your hand, I've got a Bible for you. I'll help you any way I can. As you go down the road, if you need a Bible, if you want to talk, I'll be here after service. Bill, you got a song to sing us out with? Okay. I sing praises to your name. Oh.